me to the book of Psalms, chapter 103, and would you stand for the reading of the word of the Lord? Psalms, chapter 103, verses 15 and 16. The Bible says, for, as, for a man his days are like grass, as a flower of the field so he flourishes. For the wind passes over it and it is gone and its place remembers it no more. Then turn back to me with me in scripture to Psalms chapter 25, verse 12. Who is the man that fears the Lord? Him shall he teach in the way he chooses. And today I want to start a series of messages entitled, The Making of a Man. Are you a king? And some of you ladies may think that this has nothing to do with you. And I want to tell you it has everything to do with you. And if you're single or you want to be single, maybe after this message, it will be different. And let's pray and ask God to do some things in our hearts and lives. Father, we love you and we thank you for your presence and for the anointing of the Holy Spirit. We ask, Lord, that you'll do great signs and wonders and miracles, and that you'll touch us with your presence and your anointing. Help us, Lord, to see you as you would have us to see you. I pray, Father, for any principality or power, a ruler of darkness, that would try to hinder, would be removed, and that you would give us grace that only comes from you in Jesus' precious name. And all the church said amen. You may be seated. This week has been very interesting for me, to say the least. It's been a wonderful week as we've had our general superintendent last Sunday night, Monday night, Tommy Barnett, Tuesday night, Mark Rutland, Wednesday night, Benny Perez. God moved in a wonderful way, and to say it's been busy would be an understatement. We've all been very busy, yet sometimes during the busy times, we have the wonderful opportunity to begin to reflect. And as I begin to reflect, I want God to do everything he desires through and in this church. And the question I begin to ask myself, could it be that God wants to do more for us than we can even imagine. One of the things I enjoyed so much on Tuesday night is Dr. Rutland talked about dreaming dreams. And if God wants to do more than we can even imagine, that's pretty significant what the Lord Jesus wants to do in all of our hearts and lives. Can you say amen to that? I believe all of us here need pillars or foundations in our lives. Today we celebrate a homecoming of former pastors and leaders who God has used to do great things for this church and this ministry. The church was built on the pillars of strength that each one of them brought to the table and God used. As I begin to reflect on this, I was confronted with the passage of Scripture we use as our text. Psalms 103, 15 and 16, As for a man, his days are like grass, as the flower of the field, so he flourishes. For the wind passes over it, and it is gone, and its place remembers it no more. You know, as we're thinking about this particular subject, I'd like to have all the men in this church stand, and if you're a male, you can stand too. Guys, it's your time. You always want to be a man, this is time. If you'd stand on the main floor in the balcony. Doesn't this look good, ladies? Look at all this. It's, it's very unusual. Where 50% of the church is men. It's a testimony to you and to your fortitude. Now, I want to say something to you guys. I want you to look at your neighbor and tell him, say, listen, I'm, I'm going to watch you this morning. Go ahead and tell him. And I want you to tell them this and say, listen, pastor's going to say some things that are probably going to make you real mad. Go ahead, tell them that. Go ahead. And just tell them, say, I, I, I know you're not as spiritual as you need to be. Go ahead, tell them that. <laughs> but I'm 
here for you. Tell them you're here for them. Go ahead, tell them. And I'm praying for you. Go ahead, tell them you're praying for them. And tell them, say, any faces you make, pastor may call you out. Go ahead, tell them that. <laughs> and then tell them this last thing. Remember, pastor loves you and he's praying for you. And so am I. Go ahead, tell them. And then say this and you can be seated. If you don't know when to say amen, watch me. Go ahead, tell them that. You may be seated. Now, guys, I want to tell you something. I'm going to start a class here. It's going to be for men. I'm going to talk to you more about it t tonight. And, and I don't do this. I haven't done this in the 10 years since I've been your pastor. I preach Sunday morning, first service, this service, and I'll preach again tonight. And I don't need, listen to me, I don't need one more thing to do. I promise you. And contrary to popular opinion, Sunday's not the only day I work. <laughs> but I want to tell you something. The Lord's put it on my heart. And I want to spend some time with some of you guys, and I'll talk to you about it tonight, that want to spend some time with me. I want to share with you some things for 10 weeks. And we're going to do it during Sunday school hour, so it's going to make it available to you. And I'm going to, we're going to come together, and I've already asked another man in our church. He's going to help me. And we're going to work this thing. And God has given me some things I want to share with you. But I said all this to say that, ladies, how many of you, just be honest with me. Now, come on, ladies. How many of you are a little nervous about the title, Are You a King? Come on, just, just go ahead. How, how, many, how many of you aren't going to raise your hand? Go ahead. How many of you are saying you're going to cause me marital problems if I raise my hand faster? So don't raise your hand. But I want to tell you that God has laid some things in my heart that I want to share with you today. We live in a society and a culture that has devalued men and their mission. Some would have us believe that we don't need men. Now, if you're a woman, that's no big deal. But if you're one of us, that kind of is disconcerting. Can I hear a big Amen. How many of you know we need to be needed? Say amen. amen. How many of you know we like the little lady to come home and say, oh, you're, it's a great day, you're home, baby. How many of you like that? Say amen. amen. How many of you never hear that? Don't say amen. <laughs> I'm walking a fine line here. But I want you to know in our culture today, things are so different. Others would tell us, to get in touch with our feminine side. That's what I got a wife for. She's my feminine side. That's as feminine as it's going to get for me. Do you understand? I just... Wanted to clear the air. <laughs> you know, guys, ladies, I like men, real men. I don't, I, I, I got to tell you, I get a little nervous when I'm around people that you want to say, would you please pull up your pant leg? so I can see whether or not you have nylons or socks on. I don't like hanging around those guys. <laughs> I love them in the Lord. I just need a good dose of manhood. See, not everybody's got to be like you, Pastor. I understand that. But I want you to understand some things today. Our culture is changing. Guys, we're made to feel like if you're a man and you have manly values and, and you want to you walk like God wants you to walk and be a man of integrity, it's almost like you got a bullseye on your chest that says, old-fashioned, bigot, 
or anything else you want to put on your chest. And you know something? I, I realized something. The pew is never any stronger than the pulpit. And the man, I'm in church today. I'm a Christian today. I'm spirit-filled today. I'm in the ministry today because I sat under a pastor who was a man. You never had to question him. Now, one thing I learned about my pastor, and I'm going to talk about this tonight. We're going to have some fun tonight. I'm going to say everything you wanted somebody to say, but you were afraid to ask them. Amen. Everything that you wanted to say, but were afraid to say it. We're going to do a lot of editing of tonight's tape. But my pastor, if you didn't want to know what he thought, there was a way not to find out. Don't ask. All you had to do was don't ask. Now, I believe that one of the answers to our society today is strong men. But some have taken it to an extreme. And I got an email and I want to read it to you. But before I do, Jason Spears, would you please stand? Would, would you stand? Jason, Jason, our master's commission. Now, this is my boy. I love Jason Spears. He's my golfing buddy. We kind of hang together. He's my man. Jason is my man. And you know, when, he get, when Jason gets, he, he, he's one of those pranksters and he likes to, you know, throw some junk out here and stuff. And he, 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 he likes to do that and that's fine. But when somebody gets it on Jason, Jason gives him the look. <laughs> you can sit down, Jay. <laughs> now, yesterday, yesterday we were all going out and have a good time, play some golf and everything. And Jason is like your pastor. Say golf, he says when, where, and how. But yesterday, he couldn't. And I call this to your attention because I want you to pray for my beloved Jason. Because <laughs> Jason said on Friday, his day off, he did so much of a honeydew list, he served till it hurt and it hurt his back. Lisa said, where'd he do it at? Where'd he do it at? <laughs> I didn't see that. But, so, and I want to tell you, this guy does really know about servanthood because he's taught our master's commission that, and really, he knows about servanthood. So I'm giving a little bit of a hard time, but I just want to tell you that he took his whole day off and did things around the house to serve his wife, or so he told me. But anyway, I want you to know that there's a balance in this thing and I got to read something to you. Now I didn't write this letter but someone sent it to me on the email and I want you to hear it because it's important for you to hear it. It says dear friends. How many guys? Now guys let me give you a heads up. This may not be a good time to say amen while I read this letter. Go ahead and tell your neighbor that because we don't want any blood spilt in this sanctuary. Okay, here we go. Dear friends, it's important for men to remember that as a woman grows older, it becomes harder for them to maintain the same quality of housekeeping as they did when they were younger. When men notice this, they should try not to complain. Let me relate how I handle the situation. When I got laid off from my consulting job and took, quote, early retirement in April, it became necessary for Nancy to get a full-time job both for extra income and for the health benefits that we need. It was shortly after she started working that I noticed she was beginning to show her age. I usually get home from golf or fishing about the same time she gets home from work. And although she knows how hungry I am, She almost always says she has to rest for half an hour or so before she starts supper. I try not to yell. Instead, I tell her to take her time and just wake me when she finally gets supper to the table. 
She used to do the dishes as soon as we finished eating. It's now not unusual for them to sit on the table for several hours after supper. I do what I can by reminding her several times each evening that they aren't cleaning themselves. I know she appreciates this as it does seem to help her get them done before she goes to bed. Now that she is older, she seems to get tired more quickly. Our washer and dryer in the basement. Sometimes she says she can't make another trip down those steps. I don't make a big issue of this. As long as she finishes up the laundry the next evening, I'm willing to overlook it. Not only that, but unless I need something iron to wear to, Monday, to the Monday Lodge meeting or to Wednesday or Saturday's poker club or Tuesday or Thursday's bowling or something like that, I will tell her to wait until the next evening to do the ironing. This gives her a little bit more time to do some of those odds and ends things like shampooing the dog or vacuuming or dusting. Also, if I really have a good day of fishing, this allows her to gut and scale the fish at a more leisurely pace. <laughs> Nancy is occasionally starting to complain a little. For example, she will say it's difficult for her to find time to pay the monthly bills during her lunch hour. In spite of her complaining, I continue to try to offer her encouragement. I tell her to stretch it out over two or even three days. That way she won't have to rush so much. I also remind her that missing lunch completely now and then wouldn't hurt her any, if you know what I mean. <laughs> when doing simple jobs, she seems to think she needs more rest periods. She had to take a break when she only finished half, mowing half the yard. I tried not to embarrass her when she needs these little extra rest breaks. I tell her to fix herself a nice, big, cold glass of freshly squeezed lemonade and just sit for a while. And I tell her that as long as she is making one for herself, she may as well make one for me and take her break by the hammock so she can talk with me until I fall asleep. I'm not feeling the love. I know that I probably look like a saint in the way I support Nancy on a daily basis. I'm not saying that the ability to show this much consideration is easy. Many men will find it difficult. Some will find it impossible. No one knows better than I do how frustrating women can become when they get older. However, guys, even if you just yell at your wife a little less often because of this article, I will consider that, that writing this was worthwhile. Regards to all Bob. By the way, Bob's funeral was on Saturday, July the 26th. Nancy was acquitted on Monday, July the 28th. My job is to spread the love of Jesus and make everybody feel good. Now, I want you to understand that is not what we're talking about. And I've just made some of you feel very unhappy because I described you. And you're going to go home and invite somebody to eat to dinner first to make sure there's no poison in it. <laughs> How does a man leave a legacy and live to tell about it? There are four pillars in a man's life that must be established. They are simple, yet they're profound. First of all, a king. A man a vision and of character. Second pillar is a warrior. A man of strength and power. The third pillar is a mentor. A man of faith and wisdom. And the fourth pillar is a friend, a man of heart and love. Can I share with you, beloved, that we must have strong men in our homes, on our jobs, and in our churches. This will affect every child, every teenager, and every woman in this place. And I want to share with you a series of messages that I've simply entitled, The Making of a Man. In this, I want to challenge every teenage male and every man to grow to become what God wants us to become. Because if you'll do that, then God can begin to do some things in your life. You see, I also want to challenge every woman to pray for her husband or the men in their lives to become the things they need to become. Let's examine the question today. Are you a king? Now, I'm going to tell you. I'm only going to get through the first point this morning. I'll finish point two and three tonight. And I'm going to tell you. I'm going to say some things tonight that are going to make you laugh, cry, run, and shout. You may say, oh, me. 
But every man, I don't tell you this very often. You need to be here. It'll help you. It'll put you in a place you need to be in God. Now, are you a king? If you're a king, your decisions count. Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 and 28. Then God said, let us make man in our own image according to our own likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, over the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So, why, so God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Then God blessed them, and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply, fill the whole earth and subdue it. Have dominion over the fish in the sea, over the birds of the air, over every living thing that moves on the earth. God created you and I in a special way, guys. In fact, God made men to rule. It's a good time to say amen. amen. Let me say it again. God made man to rule. I didn't say she, Jane, me, Tarzan. That's not what I'm saying. But God did say that in his word, he created men to rule. Now, I'd like all the lovely ladies, all the ladies in this church, would you please stand? Ladies, would you please stand? Come on, ladies, stand all over this place. If you're a female, please stand. I, I'm... Okay. Now, ladies, i got to ask you a question. Before I do, I want to tell you, I'm going to preface this. This is not a trick question. Do you understand that? Simple yes or no. I don't want a thousand commentaries. Just yes or no. Honest opinion. Would you submit yourself to a man who loved you, number one, who put you first in his decision-making processes, number two, and treated you with dignity and honor, number three? Yes or no? Would you gladly submit yourself to someone like that? Yes or no? Do you want to submit yourself to someone like that? Thank you. Now, you may be seated. Okay, guys. Some of you are feeling, I feel the heat. Some of you men are saying, she stood up in church. And she said she would submit to a man like that. She has got a man like that. <laughs> Come here. Come here, fella. Come here. Guess what? No, she doesn't or she'd be submitting to you. <laughs> Don't get mad at your wife. I said it. <laughs> she had a man like that. She'd willingly submit to you. I've never, you know what? Can I tell you something? I've been in ministry 25 years. I've seen something. I've never seen a lady who was treated like that that didn't love to submit. Now, I got to tell you something. God, say it with me. God. Come on, guys. God. Created. Men. Come on, guys, help me with it. I know, I know you've taken a real blow right here, but come back. God created men to rule. Say the word rule. That's a good word. Now, I want to tell you how to rule. First of all, be a wise ruler. Ask for counsel and wisdom. The Bible says there's wisdom in the counsel of many. And I want to tell you, where's my wife? She's around here somewhere. But I want to tell you, I've told you before, Jelly's my best friend. And I've made two decisions since we've been married without her opinion involved. In fact, 
She gave me her opinion and I didn't like it and I did it anyway. How many of you guys have ever done that? Don't raise your hand. <laughs> Two worst decisions I've ever made in my life. Because you know what I found out? God said he created her to be a helpmate to me. She completes me. That means if she's not involved in the process, there's a real good chance I'm going to get it wrong. And that if God's speaking to me, if I've done my job right, she's hearing just like I am. And God should be speaking to her. And there should be a unanimity in the decision-making process. And when I haven't listened and there wasn't a unanimity process, I want to tell you how graceful she was. She never said, I told you so. Some of you ladies could learn that. She just said, let's work it out. That's why I love her. Because she didn't tell me I told you so. And when I did it the second time, all she said was, I love you. I read between the lines. What it, she was saying was, I love you, you dummy, but I'm going to keep loving you. <laughs> and I want you to understand that if we're going to rule, be a wise ruler, be a decision maker, don't throw it off on your wife. You make some decisions. Get her counsel and then make a decision. Don't tell her, well, it's up to you. And then when she makes a decision, you come back and nail her for it. Get a life. Be a man. Make a decision. My ministry gift is flowing this morning. I am an equal opportunity offender. It's, I, I feel it. It's flowing through here. But listen to me. Secondly, Consider how your decisions are going to affect others when you make that decision. And, and notice with me that you need to be a benevolent ruler. Ladies, I'm going to ask you another question. Would you stand again? Just stand one more time. I know in Pentecostal churches you think you're popcorn services, but <laughs> up and down, up and down. But listen, would you... Allow a man to give direction in your life who was kind and giving, willing to put others first. How many of you would say, yes or no, I'll follow this kind of man? If he's kind and giving and willing to put others first, how many of you would say, I'll follow that man? Say yes or no. Yes. You may be seated. You're making me mad, preacher. That's twice she stood up in church. <laughs> I want you to understand something. You don't have to be a rocket science to, scientist to figure this out. God has a plan and God has a purpose. You see, you need to understand that your decisions will affect others. And when Adam was in the garden, and Eve, the Bible said, had been deceived by the serpent. But the Bible tells us Adam wasn't deceived. Adam knew what his decision, he knew right from wrong. Eve was deceived. Adam fully made a decision. And I want you to understand something, guys. Sometimes we make flippant decisions and we don't understand the consequences of those decisions. I want you to understand something that I read the other day and, and then it was reiterated yesterday at a breakfast. How many of you guys here would say, I am very introverted? I don't like... In other words, you're not a guy to stand up and get in front of a lot of people or anything. You, you don't mind hanging out with the boys, but you're a little introverted in front of crowds or whatever. How many would raise your hand and say that? How many would say you're extroverted? You're the life of the party, big crowds, you love it. You'd give anything to be standing on this platform. Anybody here? Okay, yeah. I figured, I figured. How many of you guys, you don't know what you are? Amen. <laughs> and aren't going to raise your hand. Amen. Okay, listen. You need to know this. The most introverted man, the most shy man, will in his life influence... 10,000 people. Now, I want you to think about that. Because if all we had was introverted men in this place, and I want to tell you, we don't have just introverted men in this place. We've got a lot of extroverts. Take my word for it. Look at your neighbor and say, I can tell you're an extrovert. Go ahead, tell them. 
But conservative, introverted men, 10,000 people in their life. We got enough men in this building that several million people are going to be influenced by you in your life and uh, together, corporately, are going to be influenced by our lives. So some in this building will influence a million or more by themselves. Now you think about that. You see, your decision, gentlemen, has a great ripple effect. How you conduct yourselves, the decisions we make, you see, when Adam made the wrong decision 5,000 years ago, now think about it, over 5,000 years ago, Adam made a decision, and that decision was he was going to partake of the forbidden fruit. God said, you can have anything else, but you can't have that. Eve was deceived, but Adam made the decision. Today, because of that one decision that Adam made, 5,000 years later, 50,000 people every single day die and go to hell. One man's decision. 5,000 years later, 50,000 people. I'm here to tell you today, gentlemen, that you are some of the greatest gifts God has to his kingdom. And for you to simply say that my life is insignificant or what I do doesn't have an effect, I want to blow that to kingdom come because that's the devil lying to you. What you do, how you act, the decisions you make have grave effects on everybody around you and people you don't even know. You're influencing people you don't even know right now. And should Jesus tarry, there'll be generations you'll influence. That's why it's so important that you and I become everything that Jesus would have us become. You know, Sandra Rollins was telling me that um, boys, young boys from 13 to 15 year old, old in that age bracket... One of the reasons why they get so rebellious is if they don't have their nuclear family intact. And it's the cognitive side of their brain developing and those boys get angry when they're, they're not intact. And some of you guys, I, I, I'm not here to condemn you, but I just want to tell you that there's something to be said for a man that says, I will be faithful, I will stick it out even when I don't like it. And I'll tell you something else. If we treat our wives the way God tells us to, we will like it. I'm telling you, that woman, my wife, she loves me. I'm glad she loves me. She treats me nice. She takes care of me. She'll hug me. She kisses me. She'll thank me for being a good provider, for being a good father. She knows how to push all the right buttons. She can manipulate me to do anything she wants, and I like it that way. Because when she treats me like the head of the house and the king, I'll kill myself trying to do for her. And it's this wonderful circle where if I treat her right, she's treating me right, and it's this circle over and over, good acts and kindness and love being done to one another. And it builds us up in the things of God. You see, I wonder about Adolf Hitler if his father hadn't walked out on him. I wonder if there ever would have been an Adolf Hitler. I wonder if there would have ever been and you know, in, in Adolf Hitler's day, the church here in America thought he was the Antichrist and, and for good reason, everything he was doing. I could see where they could get him confused. But you see, there never would have been an Adolf Hitler had there been a man that had done what he was supposed to do. There's another man that greatly influenced our history. And his, man, his name was Abraham Lincoln. I love Abraham Lincoln. 
Abraham Lincoln had some great, great phraseologies and quotes. Abraham Lincoln said this, guys, this is really a good quote, especially when you're in, an, in a discussion, because I know we're all so godly. We never have arguments with our lives. We just have discussions that some people can hear. But other than that, Abraham Lincoln said, it's better for a man to remain quiet and mum and people to think he's a fool than to open his mouth and erase all doubt. Do you hear me? <laughs> and one of the things about Abraham Lincoln, do you know that he ran for office five times and was defeated soundly before he, he ever won an elected office? But Abraham Lincoln decided that he had been called to do something. I wonder today if we would even have a United States of America had not a man like Abraham Lincoln stepped up to the plate and fought that demonically inspired thing called slavery and rid it from our nation. I would say to you, we wouldn't have these United States. We might be speaking German or some other language right now. We wouldn't have the freedom and liberty we have because one man, over 150 years ago, who was defeated and had his ego crushed, said, it's not over. I'm not done. His one decision, now think about it, that one decision that said, after the fifth time he was defeated, I'm not going to quit, has affected everybody in this building today. Every person in the United States today. Can I be so bold as to say that it has affected every person on planet Earth? That one way or another because of one man's decision, a small, trite, maybe insignificant decision in the state of Illinois that said, I'm going to run for office one more time. And because he did it today, democracy is a thing that is embraced and cherished. Right before we pray, your decisions can be felt throughout eternity, guys. I think about the shoemaker who won Mordecai Ham, who won Billy Graham to the Lord. What if that shoemaker had said, I don't feel like witnessing to anybody today, and he hadn't won Mordecai Ham to the Lord? Or what if Mordecai Ham hadn't obeyed God and went into the ministry and then preached the message that Billy Graham got saved in? You see, who I'd like to know the person who won that shoemaker to the Lord. I, I'd like to know the guy that, that talked to the shoemaker. Because when he gets to heaven, you know what's going to happen? Amway has nothing on the kingdom. I'm telling you. Amway got it from the Lord. Now, I'm not an Amway proponent. Don't come tell me. I'm, you may sell it. That's fine. I'm not selling it. You, I mean, sell it, pay your tithes, bring it here, amen. But I'm just selling you. The pyramid effect was long established in the kingdom a long time before Amway. And I want to know, can you imagine the guy who won the shoemaker? The shoemaker won Mordecai Ham. Mordecai Ham won Billy Graham. And Billy Graham's won millions. And the preachers and missionaries that come out of there. And it goes on and on and on and on and on. <laughs> That's why we're going to be surprised when we get to heaven. Who gets the biggest reward? Because your influence goes from generation to generation to generation. And guys, I want to tell you something. You are significant. You say, but preacher, you don't know my life. You don't know all the messes I've made. I'm telling you that the great thing about the Jesus I serve and the God you serve, and if you're here today and you haven't met him, the great thing about this God I'm preaching about is that Jesus can take what the canker worm and the locust has destroyed, and he can repair it and restore it in a moment in a twinkling of an eye. You see, the Bible says he puts our sins as far as the east is from the west, and he can remove it from us. And he can restore to us those things that have been taken from us. When Jesus was dying on the cross, he made a decision. The Bible says that he could have called 10,000 angels and come and rescued him off of that old rugged cross that was so painful. But Jesus said, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. Beloved, for 2,000 years, 
we've been reaping the benefits of that decision. Beloved, those words, let them ring again. Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. In Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, as soon as Adam made that bad decision, God stepped up to the plate and said, the seed of the woman shall bruise the serpent's head. And what God was saying was, the pearl of heaven would pay the great price to restore mankind back to God. Over 5,000 years ago, God, when he saw the problem, God the Father stepped up and made a decision. Why? Because it's in the very nature of God to rule and reign. It's in the very nature of God to restore. It's in the very nature of God to bring us back unto him and to love him. And ladies and gentlemen, the Bible says that you and I were created in the image of God. Men, you and I were created to rule and reign. Not as this world says to rule and reign, but as God the Father ruled and reigned, that when there's a problem or a difficulty, we step in and say we're going to fix it by the power of the Holy Ghost. Whatever needs to happen it's going to happen but Jesus is the great restorer give him praise if you believe that the decisions that my father made for me were critical my father was gone in those 14, 15, 16 years of age, my father wasn't home. Maybe four months in those three, four years because he was out to sea doing 10 and 11 month tours. And we had a decision to make. He finally got shore duty and I was 16 playing football and graded in the church and we were had our own culture flowing there and we had to make a decision, do we pick up from Charleston and go back and stay and move back to Norfolk or, or would he be willing to fly back and forth on the weekends on a hop so that we could keep our friends, our school, and our home? It would be a great sacrifice for my dad, but he did it. And I want to tell you, if he hadn't left me under the influence of my pastor in that particular time of my life, I would have went the wrong way. I needed my pastor. My dad wasn't there. I needed my pastor. He made a sacrifice. And God honored it. And I'm telling you, sometimes there are decisions that all of us need to make. And they're difficult decisions. They're hard decisions. But if you'll do what God tells you to do in the way that the Holy Spirit tells you to do it, you're going to see the Holy Spirit do things that are incredible in our hearts and in our lives. And today, I just want to ask you a question as our musicians begin to play softly. And that question is this. Are you a king? Are you willing to let your decisions count? Are you willing to make that decision? Are you willing to let Jesus Christ have complete authority in your life? Because you see, your life does count. You will influence most of us in this building. Going to influence a lot more than 10,000 people. I think the average probably be about 30 or 40,000 people for the average male. That's the whole city of Griffin. You have that opportunity to influence how you live your life, how you affect it. And as our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed, no one's moving. Some of us today, for the very first time, got an idea of how important our life is. It's not just about me and it's not just about you. There's other people involved. And you're here this morning Maybe you were right with God, but you're in a backsliding condition right now. I'm talking to men and women, boys and girls, teenagers. Maybe you've never known Jesus. You've never accepted him as Savior. And you realize today that if you're going to have influence and make a godly influence, a good influence on people, 
that you need the influence of Jesus in your heart. You need to give your heart and life to Jesus. You may be sitting here as a man wondering, man, that pastor really put a lot on me this morning. It's tough. No. No, I'm telling you this side of eternity, what to expect on the next side of eternity. And I want every man in this building to walk into heaven with his head high, but you can't do it unless your heart and, right, and life is right with Jesus. If you're here today and you're not right with God, by an upraised hand, man or woman, you'll say, Pastor, would you pray for me? Would you slip your hand up all over this place? Quickly, all over this place. Just slip your hand up real high. I'm not right with God, Pastor, but I want to be. Would you pray for me? Would you pray for me? Thank you. Now I want to ask a question. How many men in this building will simply say, Pastor, by an upraised hand in all honesty, you'll say, Pastor, I had no idea that my life counted like you said today. Just slip your hand up all over this place. I had no idea that my life would influence so many people. Thank you. All over this place. Now let me ask you this last question. Guys, look at me. Just lift your head up and look at me. How many of you will simply say, by God's help, I want to be a king in his kingdom. And by God's help, I want to be a decision maker that the Bible talks about that will be positive in every area of my life. If that is what you want in your heart and life, would you stand with me all over this place? If you don't want it, stay seated. But if that's what you want in your life, I want you to stand. Now, I want every lady who says, either I want my husband to be this way, I will stand with my husband as he walks this journey, or I'm believing for that special person in my life to be that king. If that's you, and you'll agree, and you'll stand with them in prayer and support, I want you to stand all over this place. Now tonight, we're going to have some fun. We'll have a time of some rejoicing and shouting and praising the Lord. But tonight, I'm going to finish what I started this morning, to, to be a king. And part of being a king is saying no to the flesh and yes to the Spirit. Amen? So you come and we'll help you. But I want you to do something. Could we join hands across this auditorium? I want you to pray this prayer with me. Jesus, I come to you today and I ask you right now to help me to become a king. Help my loved one become a king. To act and live according to the word of God. And I trust you, Lord, that you're going to help me in every area. And I'm going to believe you, Lord, for signs and wonders. In Jesus' name, amen.